written production of the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our recreation center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching. Like to, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to our member board exchange. I'm Dale Lair, president of the 2022 Board of Directors. This meeting is audio and video recorded by RCSE management and staff. Please be advised that there will be no recording of this meeting by any individual. Please take out your cellular phones or electronic devices and check and ensure that they are on silent mode. I would like to now introduce the Board of Directors and Management Personnel. Vice President Eggy. Good morning. Treasurer Aikens. Good morning. Secretary Lenevsky. Good morning. Director Collins, not here. Uh, Director Femmel. Good morning. Director McAdam. Good morning. Director Nowakowski. Present. And last but not least, Director Wilson. Good morning. Okay, our management personnel. Bill Cook, our general manager. Morning. Kevin McCurdy, director of finance. Morning. Mike Woodprue, director of buildings and infrastructure. Morning. Chris Herring, director of operations. Good morning, everybody. I don't believe Brian is here. No. Okay. Uh, JoLynn Higgins, communication and RCSC marketing coordinator. Marsha Johnson, corporate executive coordinator. Good morning. Teresa Serino. Director of Events and Entertainment, and also in our booth upstairs. Uh, additional RCSE management, Mike Deermeyer, Director of Bowling. Uh, Polly Corsino, uh, Sun City Visitor Center and Marketing Manager. Chris Lynham, a Pro Shop Manager. Good morning, everybody. Did I miss anybody other than Alan Kleinhans and Mike Crawford are audio. Oh, Mike's not here. We have a new yeah, person. Anne. Yes, Anne. 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 Hi, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> and we got Teresa already. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to take a moment to just uh, talk about our ever evolving flow to this exchange. Uh, the first item of business will be a review of past topics and discuss, as discussed, um, any suggestions that we and any actions that were taken, if any. At our previous exchange, a request was made to post the worksheet that we compiled. After some discussion, we have planned to change the display and format of the report. These changes will allow us to get the information posted as requested. I hope you picked up the document at the back, off the back table. Okay, this is kind of what it's gonna look like in the future. This document is part of the revisions we have made. It's a list of the topics discussed at the last meeting. This list was also attached to the email blast that was sent out. Well, I guess it wasn't. Okay. Anyway, in the future, we'll be putting together um, completed topics on a different page just to make this a little bit more workable. Okay. To start, I would like to recognize Chris Lynham from Golf Management to discuss the progress on multiple issues regarding golf. Chris? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So for our golf operations recommendations to member board exchange, ideas and concerns. All right, it is working. All right, so our golf issues raised. Non-resident pass pricing too generous. Non-resident portal access. Tournament play and overall dissatisfaction with allowing outside play on our facilities. 
for our non-resident passes. Passes has been offered since 2010. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, passes have been offered since 2010 with five-day access, and that is for tea times, getting on just like our residents five days in advance instead of regular outside play being three days in advance. We currently have 136 current active passes, 80 with cart, five without cart. And for our 2022 revenue, $293,509 has been raised so far through April. 3% of rounds played is what that will equal out to. For our average green fee per round, resident no fee annual passes works out to $12.37. Our non-resident no fee annual pass has worked out to $20.18. And our overall average green fee as everybody combined together works out to an average of $17.98. The next slide you are going to see a chart here. The highest number, that 1,610 players, and that is going to be our resident all course surcharge pass. That is the residents who pay $800 per pass per year. The next line down is gonna be 452 members. That is our resident all course no fee pass. That is a $1,550 pass purchased by our residents. The next one down is going to be our resident executive surcharge pass. That's our residents who purchased a pass to play executive courses only. There's 126 of those. And then we get into our outside non-resident passes. With 80 passes, that is gonna represent our non-resident with cart. And the line below that for 56 players, that is gonna be our non-resident without cart. For non-resident passes, our recommendations are to propose a $250 increase to non-resident passes. The potential consequences, fewer number of passes sold, lowering our revenue. Off of that, where any revenue shortfall would be covered by our operations or fee increases for our residents. Difficult to regain sales once changes are implemented. And for the portal access, Access was granted when automated draw was instituted to maintain the same T-type process that was realized with an in-person draw. So when we changed over to the lottery, we kept everything the same, any outside play, still got to have five-day access to T-times, just like we had since 2010. Removal from the automated process would severely limit the viability of the prepaid card. Would expect significant de decrease in past sales, especially when coupled with a price increase. Complete removal of outside pass sales could be offset by raising resident passes by an average of $105. For our portal access pass recommendations, continue to allow portal access for non-resident pass holders. Risk of losing all revenue will drive membership pricing higher. For tournament play, another big topic for our residents, tournament play accounted for less than 1% of our 2021 rounds played. Tournament play accounted for 1.6% of our 2022 rounds played through April, but accounts for 3.5% of our revenue. The line here says includes revenue from range balls, cart fees, and booking fees. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. That is excludes revenue from range balls, cart fees, and booking fees. Current non-resident tournament groups will not be booked if there is not adequate space for available member play. Unwritten policy is to have one course open both north and south of Grand Avenue. Our recommendations, addition to board policy 17, golf tournament and event criteria, we're gonna change adequate play as available for residents to one regulation course is available for non-tournament play on each side of Grand Avenue. We are currently doing this uh, it hasn't been brought up into the board policy yet, but we have been trying to make sure if we do have tournaments, we're doing one north of Grand, one south of Grand, leaving six courses available for a resident play as we speak right now. Limit non-resident tournament play bookings to 10 months in advance of request play dates. Our residents are gonna be able to make tea time or uh, book tournaments 12 months plus out. So this will help make sure that our residents get tournaments first priority. Prevent non-resident tournament play from booking more than two events per month on consecutive weeks for the same day of the week. That's if residents outside non-residents want to book tournaments on a Friday. 
We will only let them do two Fridays per month. It will not be consecutive Fridays as well. Prevent non-resident tournament play from booking during the overseed process or any other time four or more courses are closed or have golf cart restrictions. Outside play. For 2021, revenue was $1,430,240, assuming 50% of cart revenue was used by RCSC card holders. Increased cost to replace this revenue, assuming no change in play habits due to the increased fees. Increased cost would be $4.94 per round for card holders and their guests. $631 for annual no fee passes based on 452 active passes we currently have. 412 for annual surcharge passes based on, six, or on 1,610 active passes we currently have right now. So that is our summary of what we are looking at for our golf and tournaments. So if I could, if I could uh, yes. Hello? Okay. Yep. <laughs> so if I could just kind of recap. So basically, um, Residents do not pay less, or I'm sorry, do not pay more than non-residents, mm -hmm. um, both from a pass-to-pass -pass perspective and from an overall perspective um, of just rounds played. Uh, from a tournament perspective, we have already had in practice, uh, you know, tournament practices that would make sure that we have enough open tea times for our residents, but we are now going to make sure that we uh, put that into policy so that when we're no longer here, the next people uh, that come in, you know, will have that in policy. And, um, you know, so, and you can also see that it's really is a small percentage, uh, outside play is a very small percentage of what our total play is. But it does represent a, a significant revenue stream, which without that would increase, uh, you know, both golfers' costs and and potentially, um, you know, could we, we may have to raise assessments to cover that uh, missing revenue. So uh, I think that's kind of what we, um, you know, how, how I summarize this. So, Madam President, I don't know if you wanted to open this up for questions now, or if you wanted to wait. We can open it up for questions if anybody has any comments. I would like to thank uh, Chris Lynham right away for the uh, presentation. And um, does any, I know when we first brought this up, there were a lot of things about non-residents access for golf and displacing members. That clearly is not the case. Um, but if anyone from the golf world would like to get up and speak to the presentation. Jean Totten, 148753, I'm not a golfer. I'd like to know if this presentation will be available for us on the web. Well, this, this entire proceeding is going to be available for you. It, so, which has the presentation, so that's, I would say yes. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Pearson. That was actually my question, but I want to be a little more clear. I know the video will be available. Will this particular presentation be available per se? So in other words, all of the data, I mean, this is what we've been asking for is transparency I, I, and data. Correct. Will it, will it be up there? I, I, I really couldn't tell. I don't see why not. We'll, we'll, we'll try I don't to make either. that happen. That's why, but I just want to make sure that that's, okay. because it is information that's uh, relative to this discussion as we go forward. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Duly noted. All right. Um, because I have another presentation, I would like to now recognize Mike Deermeyer, Director of Bowling, and this is to discuss all the issues that came up in the past about bowling, tournaments, outside play, that sort of thing. All right. Hello, everyone. I'll wait for that presentation to get up there started. <clears throat> All right, bowling operations, recommendations to member board exchange ideas and concerns. So the issues raised was the lack of lane availability for members and uh, guest play and pricing. 
So this slide, um, with the new scoring system and point of sale system from Brunswick that we have at both locations, we have the ability to really analyze data. So I was able to take the lane usage over a typical week in the winter season, and you can see that 100% utilized is in the dark red, and then anything else in the dark green is, is the 0% utilization. That means it's open. So night times, league night, it's historically been league night in the bowling industry. It's the time the most wanted members have their organized play. So example this week, um, if you just take a look, you know, Bell has less lanes, so that's why the evening is always 100%. Um, there's, always, there's generally lanes available, a few lanes available at Lakeview. But you can look for an example, we hosted a tournament during this week on Saturday afternoon, morning and afternoon at Lakeview. That's why it's 100% there. We had 56 to 63% available uh, usage of lanes at Bell. So there were always lanes available for members, and I'll go into how we handle that later in this, in this presentation. So the next slide is a utilization summary. The top of it um, is all hours, Lakeview's only 13% full, and Bell is 23% full on all hours. And 9 a.m., I broke it down, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., 12 to 2, 3 to 5, and, and 6 and 7 p.m. is the time that's most full, with Lakeview being 38% of the time completely full, and Bell Lanes being 69% completely full at, uh, at that time. It means that generally you're gonna find that lanes are available for you to come in. Uh, the recommendation, so no change to our current league and tournament scheduling is what's being recommended. Current utilization statistics show adequate lane availability. Bowling will continue to monitor peak utilization times and no outside play during peak utilization mm -hmm. and to keep a subset of lanes of open whenever possible for members to come in. Guest play overview. So guest play was introduced to keep member leagues viable as participation decreased. The operational procedures for guest leagues were only held at times when the bowling center would have very little member use or outside of regular open hours. For example, we have three leagues that start at 8.30 p.m. at night during the winter, and the, the buildings close at 8, so that's an additional amount of revenue that comes in for, for the members to, to cover the cost of the operations. Uh, guest tournament bowling, book only at one center, always keeping the other center wide open for member play only. The only exception was the 32nd annual Sun City Open in 2022. It's a 50 and older team tournament. It's open to anyone that's a senior. It was a 32nd annual. I didn't want to change it. So it did book at both places. Uh, benefits, keeps member league bowling strong with maximum participation, introduces local bowlers to Sun City showcasing our facilities, and keeps member rates down and ensures bowling does not need to be subsidized. So the financial impact of removing guest play, that would decrease revenue by $316,000, which would force bowling into a net operating deficit of around $207,000. So the assumptions made in, in those numbers is that member bowling would stay exactly the same. Member bowling accounts for 50% of the tournament special mm -hmm. revenue. Liquor revenue would stay exactly the same, even with less bowling being, being done. And it's based on the 2009 pre-COVID revenue numbers we base that on. So in order to erase this deficit, average price for a member would need to increase 49% to 395 per game from 265. And the average price for a member league bowler would need to increase 49% to $379.20 per season from 254.40. So it's a considerable mm -hmm. price increase. Pricing analysis, so I went out and I've, I really priced the market and what, what, what's happening out in the market right now. Um, Mavericks, Uptown Alley, and Bolero, it's kind of a tough slide to see, I, I understand that, but Mavericks is, they all have variable rates for the most part. Mavericks is five to $12 a game. Uptown Alley's 333 to 750 a game. Bolero was 734 on a Saturday afternoon per game. So they have, the, the industry's changed recently, so the pricing has kind of increased for their open play. Um, we are, we're currently at 265 for a member and 290 for a guest, where R.H. Johnson's at 280 and 335 in those respective categories. So the recommendation 
is not to change the guest play policy and a price increase to reflect greater member guest differential. And we're, we're under an analysis, analysis on this, but I understand coming from outside of Sun City, it was the first question I asked. Why was the guest pricing so cheap? So we're, we're working on it. We're, we know that that is something that I can operationally take, an adva take advantage of and make sure that we keep the member rates down and we keep these facilities up for the members. Is that, that's my main goal. So any questions? No, thank you very much for the report. I thought it was very, very well put together. Okay, just a quick, we're gonna kind of go back up to the stage. And again, you've got the new format which you're looking at. This is the old format, so we're gonna kind of stick with that till, till September. Um, but there's a lot of the completes on here, and I think the way we're gonna do this in the future is we're gonna take completed items off and put them on a separate sheet so we don't, it's, it, it gets to be so much to, to handle. So moving past transparency um, and pool decking, the marquees, um, that's still um, an ongoing thing. And I know that we're currently working with ASU to, um, you know, possibly look at a uh, survey and some recommendations from them regarding uh, use of the term. Um, I don't have anybody prepared to speak. I think we're, we're just in the process of doing this, so there's nothing definitive yet um, to really discuss. Uh, the Madam Duffy Madam Land. President, Madam President. Yes, go I ahead. Just interrupt. So over the weekend, we. Over the weekend, we actually um, received the finalization of numbers and the quote. So um, we'll review that uh, this week. Okay. Okay, and then uh, you know we can make a decision on moving forward. But I think we can I think we can potentially move forward very shortly. Okay, perfect. See, you got the news just the same time I did. All right, uh, Duffy Land. Um, the suggestion and the action taken was to um, post a second sign saying Duffy Land Dog Park is for the exclusive use of dog um, card holders. I believe that's going to be put in. It's already approved and in for the 2023 budget. Um, the next uh, board member exchange, member board exchange done. Uh, pickleball uh, with, you know, the tranquility of the lake thing. We've moved on from that. Um, clubs, we're done with that. We have the Best Friends Dog Club, um, which is there's a request to put on the PIF. I did speak a little bit to some of the members who are in the audience today on uh, Best Friends Dog Club. And what we need to do is develop a business plan for that. So I will be working with members of the um, uh, dog club to try and get that report ready uh, to present to the board. And um, if there's anybody here from the, I know there's someone here from the dog club, if you'd like to get up and just speak to that, or now might be a good time. Can you get it? Perfect. Not my first rodeo. Okay, good. <laughs> good to hear. Living in a tall world. So, Madam Chairman, to the rest of the board. We really appreciate the time and allowing us to bring forward this request and the time and energy that you put forward to all of our requests. Recently, a few of you came to the Best Friends Dog Club down at Fairway and our training yard, and you saw some of the challenges that we face. We had great conversation, and I hope you found some that insightful. My service dog moved in with me pr just prior to the shutdown. Uh, she had come very well trained. In fact, I got training as well. However, during the shutdown, you know, lose it or use it type of thing. And it was very difficult to go out walking, keep public access during that shutdown, which none of us had any control over. When we did open, we were very crowded, we were mobbed, and it was not a safe place for a lot of people with any mobility issue, well, for a lot of people, and for a new service dog. I am very grateful to the members and the team of the membership of the Best Friends Dog Club and all of our great trainers. The training class 
took us from zero to 90, it giving my dog and myself great bonding activities, giving her mental stimulation, physical challenge, and allowing me to have the confidence of being the best handler in a safe and affordable venue. Socially, it provided me with many new lasting friendships for which I am very grateful. <coughs> Service dogs are not allowed to go to dog parks. I am under contract. Her socialization is limited to a few neighbors and our classes. We cannot put two dogs leash to leash, nose to nose. When we are out and about, she is working and not allowed to be social. The time during these classes with other dogs, owners and trainers, is the most rewarding time that we have spent together. Now during the hot months, now during the hot months, dog walkers are not out. Friends are not out with their dogs. I hear from friends and their other dog and our other dog club members that the club has given them many social and engaging hours for both them and their dogs. And it is more essential to gather inside a climate controlled environment. When I asked their thoughts about a year, year around facility, many of these people would get out more. They would get more engaged, more exercise for themselves and their dogs, mentally and physically. We would be the premier senior living center as we could offer educational and social events to our residents and furry friends. With an indoor climate control facility, the numbers of classes and activities are only limited by our imagination. Best Friends Dog Club would be able to continue to offer training, games that offer stimulation, bonding, enhancing skills to everyone without worrying about being too cold at 8 a.m. in January and too hot at 11 in March. We have had many people call since May and email us about enrolling in classes as they just got a new fur baby to the family. It is very unfortunate that we have to tell them that we're closed during the summer until October with classes beginning in November. Some have new puppies and need immediate training. Others have more mature pups. But nonetheless, both dog and handler need much guidance to make the best home possible and a rewarding experience for both of them. Now these folks have to wait six months. Many residents have types, many types of limitations and keep inside during the summer months. This would be, again, great enrichment, socialization, and physical for both the dog and the resident. Many of our residents with disabilities, along with myself, both dog and handler, require these ongoing exercises. And it's very sad with the population of Sun City being the premier active retirement destination that we don't have a climate-controlled RCSE owned facility, indoor facility to offer year-round canine support and social support. Coming from Sun City Grand, this would be absolutely perfect if we had this. Thank you for your time, your volunteerism, your talents, and your energies that you bring to the board. We look forward to working with you soon. Thank you, members of the audience as well. Thank Stand. you. Let's go. All right. um, I'm moving forward on, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There was another person. I'm sorry. I just wanted to comment on that same topic. I don't have a dog. I love dogs, but I don't have a dog. So I don't go to the parks and I don't go to the, the best friends club. But I, I noticed this is on here from April, and I was at the meeting when the First Lady came up and talked about needing um, a different space for them. We're now into June, which we knew was coming. 
115 degrees over the weekend. And I just, my heart just goes out to these people out there with these dogs. Some of them, that is their main social activity that they have to be able to get out. I don't understand how we could have waited until June and now we're getting ready to go into summer. Everybody's done, the board meetings are done. July and August, it'll be September. That the urgency of finding a spot, climate controlled, for these people to be able to bring their animals in and get out of their homes and have the training, you know, a puppy, like she says, if it's a puppy, it needs training now. It can't wait till September. It's too late at that time. How is there no urgency to do anything for an activity like this? And this is not the only one, but this is the one that really kind of is highlighted today, I think. And I think somebody needs to do something other than just say we're going to be meeting with them, find out their requirements. They need requirements now. You may not have the perfect space right now, but how can we not accommodate a club who's asking for assistance with the hot summer coming here? Uh, uh, just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion regarding the Best Friends Dog Club? Um, I'm going through the sheet. Oops, one more person. I just want to comment as a former dog owner when I first moved here, my most immediate, welcoming, enduring experience was walking my dogs. If you haven't been out in the mornings or early evenings in the better weather, there are more than 5,000 do 5, dog owners in Sun City. We owe it to them to provide them with adequate facilities. And I would like to see some sort of procedure in place when a club asks for something, a timeline is established, and a true procedure. I've looked at the club guidelines for how do you start one. It's kind of clear, uh, but it doesn't say, you'll know within six months, or you'll know within whatever procedure, a process needs to be in place so that it doesn't drag on for years. So thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you very much. And just to speak to that a little bit, uh, there was a group of uh, board members who did sit down and meet with the um, Best Friends Dog Club to kind of go over uh, their area, areas of concern, what they needed. You know, in bringing that information back, uh, what we need to do, um, is to develop a good business plan on if we're going to be building something, we have to ha have more than just, wouldn't it be nice? So, and I, I you know, that kind of falls on me and, you know, I, I can look at the membership numbers, that's not enough. So um, I do need to, and I was hoping, you know, Kat, Kat was one of the individuals who, um, Director Fimmel, who, who um, went with me to meet with the Best Friends Dog Club. And I think we need to um, meet again because I need some of the um, soft data points that I don't have. It's, you know, when you're talking as a responsible board person, you have to be fiscally responsible. So anytime we look at maybe making a change, um, we need to analyze and evaluate that thoroughly before we can make a recommendation. So that's where we are for for those of you who are concerned that we are not moving quickly enough on this. Okay? Thank you. All right. Um, I'm moving through all the things that are already completed. We talked about golf, continued golf, uh, traffic, completed, completed, participation, complete, complete. Okay. Reporting at meetings, hard to follow ideas, um, have charts available online. I think this, I talked to this a little bit earlier in that we're gonna change our format and go to something that's more like this. Um, pull the completed items off so that we aren't lost in all the detail of what's already um, been done and have it a little bit clearer. And, and um, as far as charts and PowerPoints or whatever, um, I know our um, info, uh, IT person isn't here. I don't believe I can't see down the, oh. Yeah, um, if, if that's possible for us to put those PowerPoints out, out there for people so that they are aware of them. So, okay, we've got that handled. Um, and then there was a recommendation 
about um, possibly having a board meeting or two in the evenings or later in the afternoon. And be because the schedule is pretty much complete for this portion of the, the year, we're gonna consider that um, in the fall. So with that being said, um, I'd like to now open the floor up for discussion. And while we don't have a time limit for speaking, I do ask that you be considerate of others um, so that everybody gets a chance to speak. Anybody who wants to speak would get a chance to speak. Um, to make it a little easier for us, I'm asking if you have an area of concern, let's say golf, you say golf, and then give us your details. That helps the lady up there typing it in. Okay. That we kind of get all the specifics down. And um, let's see. And if you want to come back up, you know, let's wait till everybody has a chance, and then you can come back up to the mic. Well, I'm sort of obli I mean, I'm sort of <laughs> monopolizing the first speech because I've been sitting here. But in spite of all my, first of all, my name is Karen Sharman, 117652. Okay, and what's your concern? My concern is the, I don't know how to phrase it. Is it, it about golf? No, no, it has nothing to do with golf. Nothing. It has to do with our community. Okay. And it's a very important issue that is coming to the forefront. And I think you guys are all aware of it. I think it is a point that is, um, I'm finding out that, that the rec district doesn't have control of the membership, so to speak, and first of all, let me back up just a second. This has to do with the, the, op, the, the opportunity right now that they're considering is to allow temporary two-year residency in communities that are senior communities that have an age limit to allow underage people to move in and, and live with a person that is 55 in the community for two years. And this is, as I'm finding out, you, Shoah is involved in this, Maricopa County is involved of this, involved in this, but they are talking about allowing people to move into our community. And not only all of these things that have been talked about this morning, but all of that is gonna be greatly affected if that happens, because we would be opening ourselves up for losing our senior status, which grants us a great deal of benefits. And there is uh, Maricopa County, the Board of Adjustments, is having a meeting on June 23rd in which I, I've not been able to get anybody to tell me if this is, if they're gonna vote on it or if they're just gonna discuss this. But think about the fact that you've got somebody living next door to you that's a little, maybe needs a little help, not a lot, but somebody moves in, granddaughter will come in and take care of grandma and she's got three little kids. Now right now, supposedly, anybody under 19 is not allowed to be, stay in our, in our facilities for, less, for more than 90 days, and that's consecutively. I mean, that's for the total year. But you're talking about two years, and you don't know how they're going to allow this to be regulated. And if you start letting families move in with grandma or whatever to take care, in quotes, to take care of grandma, it could be because granddaughter doesn't have any place to live because we certainly have a homeless problem and it can just snowball. And I think people in this community need to be aware that this is taking place and that they are actively pursuing this in Maricopa County. And it's through the Board of Adjustments. I don't have, uh, I don't have the address of the county building, but it's right down in downtown Phoenix. And, um, and I've been to meetings down there 
where they have had, you know, discussions. But like I said, I don't, I haven't gotten any information as far as I can come up with on when they are talking about voting on this to make it a reality. But if you want to consider, I mean, you can look at Youngtown. They violated the, the 55 rule many years ago, and they lost their status. And as a result, their community, while it's, you know, Youngtown's a great little town to live in, but they pay, you know, different rate of taxes and a different whole system. And you don't want to lose, we don't want to lose our senior status. So anyway, I, I just wanted to bring it to this board's attention, to whoever's here, that they need to take an interest and find out, call your Maricopa County Board of Adjustments and see if you can get any information. I know that some people have already sent uh, emails to the Adjustment Board, not only here, but SHOA. They have taken a very, um, a very strong opinion, but there again, you know, how do you know what's really going on? So, if you know, I'd like to know what the update of that is. Okay. and uh, where we stand on that. All right, well, what you, your concern is regarding the age overlay. Yeah. And, and that is something that RCSE doesn't really have any control of. Right. But I appreciate you coming forward and making the announcement, yeah. and there were emails that went out. We brought it up at the, one of the last board meetings, mm -hmm. um, had somebody come up and talk about it. Uh, the m meeting, or hearing mm -hmm. is going to be Thursday, June 23rd at 10 a.m. Right. Um, it's going to be at 205 West Jefferson Street That's in Phoenix. That's Thank you. And I, I sent an email in. I did discuss it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a group of people who are planning on going, driving down there to speak in person, but I heard from somebody today that there's an opportunity to watch or view the meeting virtually and participate virtually. But so. it will also affect the rec district with their facilities and what they have offering. You have excess people living in the home, and I, I don't say that they're going to let young children in, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And if they do, the next thing they're going to want is they're going to want access to swimming pools, they're going to want access to, uh, to whatever... Uh, benefits we have here because mm -hmm. they are currently living here. And then how is it going to be monitored after two years? Or are they going to kick them back out on the street? Or, you know, all of those things need to be, we need to know about those things. Okay. Because it's going to happen and it could happen in your next door to you for that matter. So anyway, this was just, I'm just concerned about it and I wanted to to make sure that people are aware of some of the other things that are going on in our, you know, that will affect our community and what we can offer. All of the pluses that we have, whether it's in golf or dog parts or bowling or pickleball or any of those things can all be affected by um, the residents. So anyway. That's my concern, and I just had to spew off for a bit. Okay. Well, thank you very much. For spewing. <laughs> my name is Mike Wendell, 145206. I'm actually on the show board. The best place to follow up on this is actually go to show up, because I don't carry that information exactly with me. But it is on the 23rd. It is something they have a go-to webinar set up, so you can remotely go in and participate. But you have to go to the county. You have to file that that website, you know, a, a thing. And you can go in and you just simply say, I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not in favor of it. And you'll get a confirmation back, and then you'll get something that will allow you to say, well, I'd like to attend it with, through the webinar. So you will have an ability to do that and not have to drive down to Phoenix. Uh, SHOA will have representatives down there to contest this. We've already filed it, we're against it. 
And I believe there's even some stuff maybe coming out in this week's independent, but I don't know for sure. Um, but the best thing is we've sent out things. The problem with our show of email lists, it goes to show of members. Everybody in the RCSC does not belong to Showa. So you have to tell your friends, you have to tell people, join Showa. You won't get the emails that come out, but if you go to the show website, you'll find it. It's there. And this is something that we take seriously. Uh, it's mostly the fact that someone under 19 will be living there. That's really the issue. If someone's over 55 and you know, and they're over 19, you're all living with them, that's okay. That, that kind of happens a lot in Sun City. Doesn't mean that person gets access to the rec centers unless a, uh, they get a privilege pass. They have to purchase it and be a resident, much like anyone who would rent a property, I believe. I'm not positive on all those details, but anyone under 19, and there is apparently some a child or children under 19 that would be involved in this, they don't get access to our facilities. And even the 19 year old doesn't if he's not on the deed. You know, and that's the issue here. It becomes a privilege card holder issue from a, an RCSC point of view versus a member issue. So that's really all I can say at this point. Uh, it's being taken very seriously. It is being contested. Uh, go to the show website, suncityhoa.org, all one word thrown together, and you'll find the information on it so you can go and you can register a complaint you know, or, or a comment and say, you know, I'm not in favor of it. It's not quite as easy as they say. You got to make sure they, they, they have on there the case number and a few things. You go through, fill it out fill out who you are and do it, you'll get a confirmation back. And you'll be able to, if you decide, attend it and watch it through a webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President? Yes. Madam President. Uh, Mike, I have a question. Um, uh, I want to clarify something that Karen said. Uh, she indicated that Maricopa County was making a general statement about allowing this to occur, is that something Maricopa County is doing or is this a single uh, this, individual this goes case? Back, this goes back, this is a single case, but this is a, this goes back to federal law that was implemented after Sun City was created. And it's something that allows 20% underage in HOAs in general. And I think it goes back to that. And these people, this has been an ongoing issue for a long time. Show has been on top of it, but again, you got to take someone to court to settle some of these things. Now they're trying this special use temporary permit. Uh, I don't believe it automatically renews, but I'll find out when I find out at the meeting what's going on, because I'm sure that question will come up. Uh, it's, it's more complex than, than what it seems on the simple front end. This is a more complex legal issue but it is something, we don't have a lot of it going on in Sun City. Uh, apparently it's happening in condominiums with underage, but not with the children necessarily. I don't know Mike, about that. Mike, when, are, when is Showa's general meetings? When do you have general meetings? Uh, the 28th, next? we will have our next board meeting at 9 a.m. Okay. And that's at 123rd Avenue and on Coggins, just off 103rd Avenue. Just well, people uh, have concern they it. need to get involved with Showa. Pay their pay their dues and well if you get involved, involved you get on the mailing list you'll yes. at least get things and right now our mailing list is about five thousand something you know we have um three times that in terms of the number of single family homes we have members from condominiums as well and so even if you live in a condominium you can still join showa we kind of provide some backup services to the condominiums association you know and they're their CCNRs, their CCNRs are much, uh, would I say, more enforceable in some ways and mm -hmm. can be more restrictive because it's a condominium or it's a uh, PUD or whatever you want. There's a lot of discussion about the legality of it, but they have, when you, when you move into it, you pay a fee, you have your own board, and they actually have more power than Showa has in terms of uh, single family ownership. Okay. Um I'm gonna cut you off here, so, that's okay. I think no, you've, you've done a, a good service of at least informing people that they need to get involved with Shoah. And you have the date, the time, the hearing sure. is at 10 o'clock. 
okay? Um, and if you need any further information, show us your contact point. Okay, any other people would like to come up and have an issue or concern? My name's Gary Osier, 109025, and I'm here to read a letter that John Fast wanted you to hear, okay? And it has essentially a couple of questions. John Fast number is 153253. First of all, he says, thank you for continuing these important exchange meetings and working to continuously improve them. I have two questions today I was hoping you could help me with. First, it is my understanding that the proposed Mountain View reconstruction configuration was designed to meet the wants expressed during the two, two town halls on October 1st of 2018, which were uh, expanded into a list of 66 prioritized items by a 12-member ad hoc committee tasks on the town halls and committees. I think the ad hoc report was given to the board sometime in June of 2020 and posted on the website sometime in 2022. We all know COVID had severely disrupted our lives in ways we could not even imagine in between this period of time. My first question is whether members of the clubs whose facilities were eliminated were contacted for input before the decision was made to eliminate those facilities in the design of option two. Do any of you recall? Well, first of all, I don't believe we're eliminating any clubs. That's, that's not the case. During construction, you have to, I mean, you can't have everything running. How are you gonna build something if you don't have the space to build it? So there is a, there are, I know pickleball, and this has been a hot topic that, you know, unfortunately their, you know, their courts are gonna be eliminated during construction, but they're not permanently eliminated. They were never permanently, I don't believe anybody has said that something is gonna be permanently eliminated. So there might be some inconveniences during construction, but that would be a normal process. Okay. My second question is a kind of a follow-up to the first question, and I'm not really sure how to ask it. I'll do my best. My understanding is there were over 30,000 members at the time of the town halls, and only about 450 of those members attended one of these meetings held on a single day. As I would expect, not every one of the members in the town hall had the opportunity to speak but understand some folks attended both town hall sessions and spoke at each one. I was wondering whether you all feel that the wants of the small number of 450 members who spoke at the town halls is enough data to base such, large, such a large decision on. Also, can you give us an update on the detailed plan work? Okay, well, I'm going to just speak generally, and anybody else, please jump in on this. Um, yes, we did two, have two town hall meetings. That was after the Long Range Planning Committee had spent an entire year evaluating this project. Then they had their town hall meetings. They came back the following year with their recommendations, which were discussed by the board. Then, at that point, once it was approved, an ad hoc committee was formed where they got and time has gone by. This is, nothing happens like this, you know. It's, you're talking a lot of money. There, it takes a lot of time to, to noodle things out. Um, and we gave it to the architect for um, a concept drawing or whatever you call it. I don't know. At any rate, between the first meeting in June and the last meeting in June, the first meeting, many members that attended that meeting came up and discussed their concerns, and they were concerned that there wasn't adequate or close enough um, handicap parking. You know, I was not at that meeting, although I watched it online, and I wrote in immediately, my major concern was safety, security, and access control. 
and being the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee and having spent a lot of time looking at these very options, architecturally, the cheapest way to control safety, security, and access control is architecturally. If you blow that, it's long-term, ongoing operating costs to achieve that. Plan A did not address it. There were multiple points of access. It wasn't a central area. There were open areas. Sun City and everywhere you go, things are changing. And we have to be attuned to all of these things. Because of input like that, we went back, gave the architect that this needs to be shored up. This is, a, this is an architectural drawing concept design that didn't address those very, very basic needs. Nothing to do with clubs. Absolutely nothing. The drawing came back, and the handicapped parking and accessibility was addressed, and most importantly in my eyes, was the safety, security, and access control. Now, unfortunately, because of that change, the building was rotated, which eliminated the pickleball courts in the short term. I understand that, you know, and I never, and I've said this, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, pickleball was never being eliminated. And, and for people to constantly come up and bring this up over and over and over again, how somehow there was this magical thing that happened between the first June meeting and the second June meeting is nothing but misinformation, because that is not how it took place. So I'm going to say it now. I hope everybody hears it. It's going to be broadcast. Wonderful. And I will tell you again regarding pickleball. They are being displaced. It's a busy club. They have a lot of activities going on. We are actively looking right now at finding a place that would be suitable for them in the term of, of um, construction. What was proposed for pickleball, and it's not, nothing is set in stone, but maybe looking at the opportunity to have some indoor space for pickleball so that we don't make the same mistakes as we did for the Best Friends Dog Club so that they have a space during the summer where they can be active throughout the day it's just, instead of limited because of the weather. So that's where things stand right now. And, you know, I know I hear there's a small group that keeps beating this horse on, you know, that the clubs didn't have input. There were members of the Pickleball Club, I can tell you, they were also members of the Long Range Planning Committee who sat on that ad hoc committee. I had two of my long range planning people sit on that ad hoc committee so that they could give all the information and all the work and all the time that was spent on a lot of these other issues. I'd like to comment on the ad hoc committee. We made sure that everyone who was involved in activities down the committee was represented on that committee. We made sure that we had every activity. So you had somebody from lawn bowling, you had somebody, okay. So, so there and where, so when you talk about what, what the town hall that was one uh, group of information, you had two, um, I believe almost two years of the Long Range Planning Committee before I was involved uh, looking at Mountain View and their research and their information. And then you had the ad hoc committee that had all the, the um, activities covered. So that's my answer to that. Anybody else like to comment? Madam President? Yes. If I could, just uh, when you look at both options one and two of Mountain View, I know option one had uh, the potential to keep uh, pickleball and, and those amenities open uh, based on the situation of the building. However, there was no guarantee that that was going to be the, be the case. Um, that was best case, uh, you know, but when it comes down to construction, uh, you know, the construction company from a security perspective may have closed it down. Um, and not only that, I don't know that members would want to go down there and, and play while they're, you know, the construction is going on. It's loud, it's dusty, uh, it's noisy. So, there, you know, the positioning of the option two um, just it covered everything that was brought up with respect to, uh, you know, the, the issues related to option one. President? Yes. I just have a couple clarifying questions. In the question, and I'm not saying the number is correct, 
it was indicated by Mr. Fast that there were only 450 people who attended the meetings. Were those meetings open to the public? Yes. Yes. Was it mandatory that the 30,000 members show up, or could anybody who, I mean, could anyone show up who wanted to? Yes. Yes. So the people who didn't show up made a choice not to? Right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have one last thing. It says, thanks again for continuing these very valuable exchanges, and thank you all, thank you for all you do for Sun City. I know you have a tough job, and we really appreciate the work you do. I know many members, including me and the member I am commenting for, also appreciate the opportunity to offer informal input to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Christy Swenson, number 137489. Never thought I'd ever remember that number. For, okay, here we go. We're on pickleball at Lakeview. And, and I think I didn't get an answer, Dale, from what you just said about what, what is happening. Is there anything going on over there with Lakeview? I, mean, I remember you saying that before any spade is turned at, at Mountain View, that there's going to be pickleball at Lakeview. And now we hear that there's a problem with status, with a problem with the tennis courts not wanting to be used for pickleball. There's all kinds of stuff going on over there. And yeah, you're right. It is not not misinformation or disinformation. It's rumor, mm -hmm. but we're hearing it, and, and we want to know what the status is. What is going on with pickleball? Well. I have no problems talking about this. And when you do hear rumors, it is a lot of rumors and misinformation, which gets everybody, there's a lot of um, angst uh, regarding that. But um, I don't know if um, Mike or uh, Bill would like to discuss pickleball, where we're at in the, in the I, I don't like to bring anything forward to the general membership until I know the, the facts. Oh. But, I, I but let's, let's have them Kill at least tell you where Bill. we are in the process. What do you have to say about that, Bill? Sure. This or, Mike, this Mike Whipper, Mike. Okay. Director of uh, Buildings and Infrastructure. We have a small contract in place with CCBG right now to do a master plan view of the tennis court area at Lakeview. They're going to present us a couple ideas of what might or what could work. I've got a preliminary sketch that's showing uh, an overlay of uh, approximately uh, 16 courts on that space that would have to expand a little bit, but could fit. That's as far as we've taken it. To, to go to the next step, you need to do a real uh, design contract, civil engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So but, we're, uh, we're back to square one with that then, huh? It's not square one. It's, well, it's, it's showing that it could work. Oh, okay, moving right along. Um, I, I want to ask a few questions about Mountain View. Um, Bill said last time at our last meeting that you guys were getting ready to, to do negotiations with the architect and contractors about Mountain View. How's that going? It's going slowly. The principal at CCBG is father passed away. I don't have their final contract mm. ready, but it will be presented to um, upper management here. And I'm assuming the board and bid committee to finalize the contract. So a personal emergency interrupted our whole thing over here then, which is okay, you know, I. I am in favor of people taking time for family. Um, so we don't have any blueprints yet. That's correct, ma'am. Okay. Do our, does the plan for Mountain View include phase three? No, ma'am. Okay, so there is no pickleball, no, no um, mini golf, no lawn bowling going in over there at all. Not to date. And is it not a good idea to, to make sure that we have room for everything that's there, or this plan right now? Because um, according to my um, information, 
We, we have 55, approximately 55,000 square feet of new uh, building going on in there, which requires 275 parking spaces. Are we going to have adequate parking? Mm -hmm. Do we know that for sure? For phase, one, for phase one and two, we certainly do. Okay, okay. And, and also, um, how about traffic? Now, now the CCBG people said that that um, co current use eliminated the need for a traffic study. I I think that is not not correct because current use has nothing to do with future use, which is planned by both the gym people and, and the players. So I, I want to know why or if there's going to be a traffic study. I mean, look, look at Claire in 107th where the Sun Bowl is. There's a traffic jam down there all the, every, every Sunday night or almost every Sunday night. And that's not what I want to see the people in Mountain View dealing with, is, is traffic and cars parked all over the place and fumes and all that stuff. But I tend to run on, but I am, I am very, very concerned about the traffic up there. Is there any way that you guys can ask Maricopa County to do a traffic study for us? Do we have to be mandated to have that done? How does that work? Ms. Svensson. Ms. Svensson, so if we're not required to do a traffic study, I'm not sure that we need to do that and spend the money to do that. I mean, it's it's basically we're use, using that space for similar use that we're utilizing it now for. Um, so, and then when you make a statement about every Sunday at Sun Bowl, I believe we have eight Sundays where we have concerts there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's well, not it every Sunday, like but but I get it. There's you know uh -huh. there's definitely there's traffic there, but. When you when you move there, I mean, it, you know, it's a known issue, or not an so issue, you, but it's a known you fact. Are, you are saying, Bill, that there will be a traffic study. No, there no. won't be. No, I, there's no. We have no requirement to do it. But, well, we have a moral obligation to do it, I think, because that that whole area is going to be overrun with with people and cars and noise and exhaust fumes. But that's my opinion, and, and I, I'm just here to share it with you guys. I'm telling you, it it's, could go really bad if we don't have a traffic study done there. Really bad. And, and, but I am, I love Sun City. I want to be here. There's no other place on earth I'd rather be. And in the afternoon, you're going to find me in some pool somewhere saying this is the best place on earth to be right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Madam, Madam President, I need to make a clarification. Oh. Pull the mic closer to you. Okay. I need to make a clarification. It was stated that the well, technically true that there's no phase three and that pickleball is not there, that lawn bowling is not there, that miniature golf is not there. It's not my envisionment. In fact, I envision them being there. Mm -hmm. And although we're talking technically about uh, there's not being a contract, that doesn't mean they're not going to be there. And I don't want there to be any misunderstanding of my view. I'm not speaking for anyone else here. But that's what I envision. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's that's actually a very valuable um, point to make. It's, the question is if it's on the plan. It's not on the plan because we're only doing the other phase. But that doesn't mean, and again, I'm repeating myself, that any clubs or any activities are being eliminated. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Don Shore, J27140. Um, I'm getting a little tired of all the people with the red herrings that they're trying to stop the Mountain View project. 
stop with the silly stuff. Uh, just to give you some additional uh, research, Section 1102 of the public uh, assembly uses for parking, all other parking assembly areas, one space per 200 square feet. The currently, there are 265 spaces serving 53,000 square feet. The original footprint minus the storage areas, which are non-public, is 43,570 square feet. It means Maricopa requires 218 parking spaces. Let's get on with this. This is getting nonsensical. Thank you. Anybody else like to make a comment or have a concern? Please come up to the mic. Hi, Joanne Greeny, 106561. And my topic is a concern of not having any meetings for two months uh, consecutively. And I feel as though, number one, look at all these projects we're working on and to take two months off. Things are moving slow enough as it is. I know you might not have all of the people attending maybe a July and an August meeting, uh, but at least you would have many of us attending so that we don't go into a stagnation of nothing happening for two months. I feel as though by taking two months off, a thought, is that it seems to be uh, gearing towards the people that are snowbirds rather than the majority of us that are year-round residents, year-round meeting attendees. So let's, you know, things still happen during July and August. Maybe December and July would be the two good months to take off. Um, because so many people are here or out of town with families. And July and August are pretty rough here, but I, you still have to keep moving. We still have to keep going forward. The lake projects, all of these projects still have to keep going, and I think that we need this um, interaction even during the warm months. Uh, let's see, I think... The, um, you know, a, a follow up to the last comment about parking and something that this gentleman referred to is maybe a quick report on how many parking places each one of the rec centers have currently <laughs> and, um, and see how well all of these places do have ample parking. Uh, the only time we don't have ample parking, in my opinion, is the sun, the sun Bowl thing, which I don't go to anymore because of that issue. Uh, the, the annual membership meeting, we were full and had to park over at the church. That happens once or twice a year. Um, things like that happen. Maybe um, when you have some of the Wednesday night concerts, it gets kind of busy. But yeah, those are special events. That parking does get tough. But I think on a regular basis, I'm sure the contractors have um, put that in mind and will uh, make sure that everybody is accommodated. Uh, so I guess just as a quick recap, I think taking two months off, it just is gonna slow down all of these other issues that we have going on. So I would like to make a motion, a suggestion, to take a look at the calendar and have two non-consecutive months for these meetings. Thanks. I would like to just comment on that. Um, the board doesn't meet regularly during the months of July and August, but I can guarantee you that nothing stops um, just because we're not meeting. Everybody's taking vacation and, you know, there's a lot of members that are gone. However, we have full-time uh, management personnel. They, they are here throughout and moving the process forward. If there's anything special that comes up that needs, you know, uh, somebody to come in and t take a look at something or make a decision, that can be done. Um, but we like to have a lot of that stuff in place. The, the lake, for example, that you brought up, that's, that's a done deal. The timing is there. The fact that we're not meeting is, does not slow that or stop that or cause any problems with that at all. Uh, the same is true for Mountain View. That project, you know, um, we'll get the, the move to move forward on that, we'll get the design plans, 
um, and that will go forward. You know, it's nothing just, you know, we don't close up shop and everybody goes home for the summer. Um, so it, it continues to work. It's just that these formal meetings probably will not happen because there are many members of the board who like to travel and take some time off. So that's part of it. Thank you. Madam President. Yes. If I could just add that, thank you for that. Operationally, we, we do not slow down at all. As a matter of fact, we try and take advantage of, uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our population not being here um, by doing our repair and ma maintenance um, projects while people are not here so that we don't interfere with the usage of our facilities. So in some instances, we actually pick up the pace with respect to operations. Um, you know, with respect to Viewpoint Lake, we still are going to have monthly uh, review sessions, Q&A sessions with the members. Uh, and with homeowners, um, so that's not going to stop. We still will give everybody updates with respect to progress there as well. Susan Bjork, 112-650, hello. Um, I'm actually here to talk about something else, but I just wanna state a comment about the report and your changes. If you're gonna move the completed off, maybe either put it at the end and have a completed section so that people that are following online can see what's all been completed and how it's been completed. And then really quick, with regard to transparency, um, I think it keeps coming up, and I know you say complete because you provide all the reports, but I think what's missing is we're still we still have a hunger for the data and due diligence. So in the committee reports or when you're presenting, if there could be some kind of uh, enhancement to that to, to help people understand what's going on, I think it would eliminate some of the issues that keep coming up. So um, just a suggestion. So what I am here to talk about is incident reports and hearings. With my understanding, the bylaws state right now that you need three incident reports for a hearing to be um, called. Is that accurate? That's what the bylaws state. Not necessarily. Okay, can you tell me what other, and here's, here's why I'm asking this. Um, incident reports are sometimes brought forth by other members, um, other people, and I'd like to understand what you're doing about what, how you handle, uh, what are the consequences for false, uh, frivolous, or even defaming incident reports that are called against someone else, and how are you handling that? Because that could wind up in significant legal issues if, if it continues. So that's where, that's, I'm just wondering what you do relative to, you know, people bringing up these um, incident reports? The nope. incident reports, depending upon the severity, it may, on the first incident report, go into a hearing. So it depends upon the severity of the incident. Each, each one is weighed by themselves I, when we're looking at them. We have to look at each one and then decide what it is that we have to do. There is no set guidelines there that, you know, you do this, 30 days. So there's no consequences for bringing up anything that might be We're not false saying that. We're not saying that. It depends on each case. If, a, if an incident report comes in and it's, it's a he said, she said, and it's frivolous, no action is taken. Mm -hmm. it, it, no action is taken. So there's nothing in your you know, file, nothing, nothing happens. Right. Okay. So, and it's confidential, so nobody, it's, we're not saying anything against somebody else. Mm-hmm, okay. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, um, and I'm assuming that the whole board weighs in on all these hearings and, and things that may result in incident reports that are deemed appropriate for hearings. Not necessarily. What happens is if an incident report comes in and it's a significant incident, mm -hmm. um, the president will usually ask several members of the board to sit in on that hearing. And they would run that hearing. I would, I would place one person that would be like the chairperson of that hearing. 
that follows the, the format for the hearing itself. Okay. Then if the, it comes back that there's uh, someone says, oh, well, I want to challenge that or I want it reviewed, you know, then you would have the whole board that would be involved in that. But first it would come to the president. And in, in that case, if I think the judgment, they follow the procedures, um, everything is audio and video recorded during this hearing. So you review all that if that's it's if they followed all the procedures and the I agree with their decision, then there would be no appeal. If um, if if someone's concerned or they say, well, you know, then we would bring the entire board into that review everything. Everyone would have an opportunity to review those tapes, videotapes, and audio tapes and then make a decision and vote on it at that point. Does that help you? Yeah, is there, is there a definition around significant or frivolous or false or anything like that? Because that might be something that sure. would be good for Absolutely. adding so to Absolutely, so if bylaws. someone pulled a gun on you, that would be considered, that would take you right up to the top and there would be a hearing <laughs> yeah. regarding that. And that has happened. Right. So I, I wanna say that if it's a, well, she said this and she said that, that's kind of like grade school stuff. And I'd say, well, hmm. you know, I mean, if it's just a, that's silly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does Thank that you. make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Browns, 155997. Mr. Herring, Mr. Cook can correct me if I'm wrong, but to back up, the process is if someone submits an incident report, Mr. Herring is to notify the person cited in that incident report, he's to ask for their explanation and then he's to do uh, an investigation and make a determination. That happens all at staff level before any of you know about that. Is that correct or not? Generally, I can say, and I'll let Chris talk to his point, I only get involved in something if um, our risk management says, okay, this is an incident regarding a board member, that's, then I get, I get okay. to know about that, or if it's a serious incident that moves you. right up, then I'm involved. Okay. All the other stuff that happens between uh, this resident and this resident, no, I'm right. not involved. Madam, Pres Madam President, uh, Joe, uh, you are correct. Uh, we do go through a, a communication process with the individual in the incident report, requesting that they also complete an incident report to give their side of that story. Uh, we have letters that we send that we have changed that language over time because we wanted it to be consistent with what is in the bylaws. Uh, because the bylaws cause, call for us to request cease and desist certain activities. Uh, and so it, we, we didn't have that in those letters previously because it was a little bit harsh, but we've, we, we now include that language because it is consistent with the bylaws, but you're correct. We will, we will ask for that other uh, uh, perspective and take that into consideration when we review the original incident report. Thank you. Uh, my name is Melvin Haas. Um, my number is 114378. And uh, I'm the president of the tennis club. I want to talk about tennis. But I've, but I like to um, um, give some information first, but, uh, and then I'll give you the, um, uh, up for the ideas, the bulletin, um, bullet for my ideas. Uh, anyway, uh, I've been coming out here for over 50 years. My dad retired out here when he was 80, and my brother lives out here now, and my sister lives out here, okay? And so I've been able to see all the advancements that RCSC has done. And I recommend, or I mean, I commend you on the um, facilities that you've accomplished in it and, and upkeep. Um, one of the facilities, like I say, is, um, Fairway, that is a remarkable building and a remarkable facility. And uh, I remember going, my dad played pool over with the Quince, uh, Quin, uh, Quince and Huts. They're just little buildings, you know, they were never, they were never meant to be there permanently anyway. Same way with um, Fairway. Um, the, um, I mean not Fairway, uh, excuse me, um, Marinette. The facility there that they created for the pickleball facility is uh, fantastic. Um, I have some bullets for that also. 
But anyway, um, then they upgraded the um, mountain, um, uh, not mountain. Anyway, um, the facilities that you guys have done is top notch and you sh should be recommended as uh, applauded for keeping them up and doing such a fine job on them. Um, so with, in that regard, I wanna discuss a little bit about the tennis. Uh, first of all, the one over at Mountain View, you guys did talk about the pickleball staying, but never mentioned anything about the tennis uh, facility staying there. And I would just like to, one of the bulletins would be to have them considered, if they're limited in space, that it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, that much more money and, and the facilities stick around here so, so long that could they consider putting um, a covering over the facility of both the pickleball and the tennis courts, and that would eliminate any problems of getting rid of them, which has been the rumor. I mean, I've gotten a lot of rumors from my tennis associates, and, uh, and like I said, I like to clear that up. Um, some of it was cleared up today by saying that the pickleball courts were gonna stay, but there's no mention of the tennis courts. Okay, now the other one is Lakeview. And there is some uh, consideration that Lakeview was gonna be, tennis courts were gonna be converted to pickleball courts. Well, let me tell you that the Mountain View facility has 10 courts, and everybody is aware that most of the people do all their activities. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, most of the people in Sun City do everything early in the morning. You know, even the uh, golf, I live on a golf course on hole 12 north, and the most majority of the people golfing or pickleball or tennis is in the morning, okay? So what I'm getting a point at is our facility at uh, Bell Center is completely full in the morning. A lot of times, we're completely full. We used to have the ones over at Lakeview, and they are in such a bad situation that actually the one of the courts is locked. Now, I was president for, this is my fourth year term, or my four year term, and I requested that the courts be repaired so I mentioned to him that in a safety concern that the one court was in, in disrepair that somebody could get hurt. So they did lock that. Well, I kept reminding them that they should be repaired so we could use them. Now they're in such a disarray that people can trip over the, the cracks and the holes that they haven't uh, been uh, addressed to. Now, that is because probably the long-term goal of Mountain View and pick a ball looking at another place to expand, okay? I'm okay, I think um, there's a consideration, another bullet, a bullet is that if they do do pick a ball. It died. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. I didn't know if you could move that. Thank you. It, it helped a lot. Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, what I was getting at was um, one of the suggestions was making the Lakeview courts and the pickleball courts, but I'd like you to have a consider, a consider that the noise of uh, playing the pickleball like they do at, at uh, Marinette has irritated a lot of people around the surrounding area, and I know they're looking at that as a problem at Marinette. But when you play in uh, miniature golf at Lakeview, and you're walking in the nice um, uh, walking path up the, you know, the uh, hill or the walking area over there, I think that would interfere with the uh, 
the peacefulness and the enjoyment of that lake if you had the pickleball courts there. But if that's the case, it has to be, it has to be. I would suggest that not only making it as a pickleball courts, if they are gonna go through with it, is make it with a tennis courts also. And my suggestion is, as a bullet, is you make, the, the nets are two different heights. So the pole could be um, there for a tennis, and it would be a louver that the net would go up, swing up, and lock in place for tennis. And then for pickleball, it'd come back down for their height. So it would accommodate both places, okay? So that's my other bulletin is they could do that for uh, Lakeview, make it both pickleball and tennis. And they could do one more thing is they could actually cover it. Um, but um, my biggest concern is not the covering there is I'm gonna get to Bell now. Now Bell, like I said, is the facilities used quite a bit. And if anybody stands out this morning, if you went outside at six o'clock, 6.30, and it was 87 degrees out, it was very comfortable in the shade. If you stood out in there in the sun, the temperature on your arm is very intense and you can't really play, okay? Um, so my bullet there for uh, Mountain View, I mean, uh, Bell Center, tennis courts, is to put four retractable uh, covering over the tennis courts on the four north tennis courts. This would cause the shade to not interfere with the other courts. The way the, situa the, way the courts are designed, it's um, they're from south to north. So if you had the last four courts, uh, I believe they're uh, 10, 9, 8, and 7. 10, 9, 8, yeah. They would be shaded. They wouldn't interfere with other courts, okay? Now, because of the wind, and I think about uh, the covering they do at the pools, there would be very easily to have it retractable and, and come back out depending on, um, you know, you have a winch and you press a button, they come back in. You could also hook that into a, um, I like to do retractable awnings where there's so much uh, wind, it automatically retract. Also, they could even have it where you could have an opening and then flaps would come up, let the wind go through and then come back down with weights. Uh, I actually have a call to um, USAshade.com um, to have them look at what that would cost to have that done. And I'll give that to Madam President when I get that um, design or whatever. Um, now, the other bullet I have is pertaining to the pickleball courts. I'd recommend that at Marinette, such a great facility, and they, they made a little bit of a mistake in, in uh, putting the wiring up and then uh, the sunscreen because of the, uh, because of the um, lighting effect. They had to do that of a complaint of the players. Now what I would recommend would be, it's not that expensive to put smoke glass on all the windows, build it up a little bit if they have to, but make it smoke glass so they can look out and put air conditioning in. They already have the, the solar to run the air conditioning. It is not that expensive. And you would get eliminate the odor that is associated with that enclosed facility because of, um, like, when you have a lot of people playing, you're, uh, the sweat, the, the, just, just all around, it'd be better health um, if it was air conditioned. And you could rent it out easier, too, for more tournaments. Um, that were my bullets, and I appreciate your input, the letting us talk, and, uh, and uh, I like to talk to Madam President later on. We were uh, going to have a meeting. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And I appreciate, um, I hope this time I don't get cut off in the sense that the last meeting I was in, I was on a video conference. 
and I was watching it, and just when I was going to get talking to it, they must have had a technicality or a problem with their, but my part was cut off. And so I addressed this earlier, but uh, nobody ever saw it because I think I was, well, actually I was cut off in the, um, the video. So I hope I st am still there. Uh, but thank you very much again. Thank you. Madam President. Madam President. Um, this gentleman said he was president of the tennis club, so I can appreciate his efforts on behalf of the tennis club. But I'm a little concerned about something that he said about contacting contractors and requesting bids. And I'm wondering what the procedures or protocols are when uh, a club such as, I'll use the tennis club since this gentleman brought it up, has a requirement whether or not the officers of the clubs or members of the club should be going out and talking to contractors or whether or not their needs should be brought forward to management, perhaps, for them to consider whether or not management should be going out and working directly with contractors on accepting bids. To, well, can I'm I just, clar cur just curious. Can I clarify that a little bit? I, I didn't, um, the reason for the uh, uh, requirement or what I wanted to do was not to put the RCSC in jeopardy or anything. I just wanted to know from my own uh, information what would cost. And then I would, because I wasn't gonna set up a contract or do anything in my, in my uh, uh, representation, I was just trying to find out what a cost would cost so I could be available to give it to the board as just an idea, okay? Not something that um, they're committed to do, or, and I, like I said, I uh, haven't even got, uh, they haven't got a hold of me yet either, yet. And I'm not um, requesting them to perform this, I'm just asking for information. Yes, sir, I, I didn't mean my comment to seem like a critique, it wasn't. Oh. It was a quest, request for clarification oh. for me to understand the proper, you know, what the procedures are. Okay, well, I, I didn't that. know what the procedures were either, so thank you very okay. much, too. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you. I was just going to call on you. <laughs> uh, Director Fimmel, uh, it is the policy that clubs don't engage with a contact contractor directly. Um, it would be that they would signify what their requirements are, what their desires are, and then we would go to uh, an approved contractor on the RCSC list to get that um, quoted uh, for their for their work. We do this um, quite frequently with, with different clubs that have requested facilities changes. Um, certainly there are members that have have experiences that they rely on in order to provide estimates and, and input to that. And, you know, that's appropriate or uh, possible, but it's when they start, begin to engage in, uh, with contractors that, that we ask them not to do that and work through our office. Chris, could you please um, tell the audience, you know, the, the procedure for clubs on an annual basis for, you know, major projects or uh, capital improvements. Yes, Madam President, um, audience, the, the clubs submit an annual um, budget request to the club's office. Um, this may be uh, for uh, improvements to their club room that are built into the building. It may be uh, furniture or fixtures that they're requesting. That comes to our office to review. Uh, we do prioritize those items. Uh, we are going through some more formalization of that at this time, but we'll go through that and then communicate back to the club should that uh, um, you know what what the disposition of that there may have been some miscommunication between our clubs office and back to the clubs where that has not been consistently done but it's our vision that we would provide that communication back to them um, now not every club request is possible to be completed. Um, in fact, we've had some club room requests over the last several years that rather than close a club one year to do flooring and then close the club another year to do lighting and ceiling, is that we will come back and say, let's do this entire project at one time and close the club for maybe an extended period of time during that summer to do all of the necessary work that allows us to be a little bit more efficient in that process, close the club to members fewer times. Uh, and it, at the end of the day, that actually results in fewer budget requests because we get more of them handled at one time. Well, thank you. Um, I was a little bit nervous, but I, I didn't really get to get my thoughts all the way through. Is 
When I said that uh, Mountain, I mean, um, Bell Center, tennis courts are being full. Um, a lot of the older people would play at Lakeview, okay? And that would alleviate a lot of the uh, courts filled at Bell because they, they would gather there and play, okay? I actually recommended that they didn't play there and come back over to Bell because of the facility was in, sh in, in um, poor shape. Now, I had that request sent out, and I have a copy of it, if you'd like to see it. Um, I took a picture of it and kept it. But I turned in that request to have them courts redone and, or maintenance and looked at. And I have never had a reply whether it come back or not. And I don't know if the paper got lost or whatever happened. Uh, that's here or say or whatever. But anyway, I do have proof that I've sent it in. And I actually did send it to all the board or all the tennis members to show that I was addressing the situation. Because a lot of times they look at me and say, okay, I'm, I'm pretty laid back and I don't really go after things unless it's very necessary. Uh, like, like somebody was saying before, before uh, this piddly stuff about talking back and forth, um, I let it work out by themselves, except when it gets to a point where it's, it's um, bad for somebody to, uh, you know, for instance, when I first got there, the, the uh, fence was curled up on the side of Lakeview, and the wire that went across it was removed or broken or whatever. So that was a, a, a injury situation that could be if they ran along the fence or whatever, could cut, okay? So I had the rec center address that and they did take care of that right away. And I, and I commend you for doing that, you know? Um, but, you know, when they locked that court, when I mentioned that one far court, that's been locked for four years and it's an under construction. Under construction for four years is a little bit extreme, okay? Um, now, uh, I'm not trying to, criticize in the sense that I, I know you have a lot of plans and a lot of things you got to do, okay? But, you know, why we let the other courts get elapidated and get worse by just putting the tar in it and, and repainting them, that would have solved the whole process of resurfacing everything, okay? Now it's at a point where the whole courts all have to be resurfaced. Now, I went to a long-term meeting um, quite a few months ago, and I spoke up in that, and then I wasn't really supposed to, I guess. <laughs> I wasn't aware of it, but anyway, I addressed it that in the long-term meeting, they were gonna do something about Lakeview uh, 10 years down the line. And that was supposed to be, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of requirements that they were gonna do, okay? Uh, but who knows if they're gonna do it, just like Mountain View yet. Mountain View has to be first done, and and then the lake will be dressed. Um, Oak Mount, that was the word I was thinking about. When people was gonna uh, remodel that, and a lot of the people resented, or not resented, voiced their opinion they wanted to keep it the same because that was one of the first rec centers. And they understood, and you guys understood that, and you kept it the way it was. And, I, uh, and it, you just did a facelift, and it looks great, okay? So you are listening to the people, I'm not saying you're not, okay? You are doing what they're asking, and you gotta be commended for the well-maintained of the facilities that you do have, okay? There's a lot of them. Um, I do have one objection, I guess I'll bring it up. One of them is, uh, I, they changed the ruling when we used to check in at the tennis club. They made a list, and it's a pet peeve. I mean, they made a list that um, I was supposed to have the, the tennis players sign, and then they were gonna look at that list, the board, or the, the club, or the you guys, would look at it to see the attendance. And I kept arguing with the um, tennis, um, or not tennis, the club manager that, you have a facility here. Why don't you just have them card in? I don't want to police it. I am not here to police 
people to sign in because if they don't want to sign in, I'm not going to sit there and make them sign in. But that doesn't give you a very good representation of the activity at the club. So finally this year, they actually made it where the tennis players will go to the rec center at Bell and sign in and it's recorded, okay? Which is, when I did that and had that paper, nobody ever collected anyway. The point I was getting at is they removed the miniature golf at Marinette to put the pickleball courts in and to make the ravine to hold the water, okay? That probably was removed because statistically nobody played there. They never had a monitor there because the monitor was in the building, so a lot of people. I played there, my dad played there, my brother and sister played. There's a lot of people that played there, okay? That facility's gone now. Now whether it comes back or will it, you know, but the point is I'm getting is we have to be very careful how we look at um, the statistics on whether it's the usage of the facility. I think Del Webb made the, this area in such a way that every facility or every place, the people didn't have to travel that far to get to, okay? They really enjoyed the, uh, the miniature golf. They really enjoyed the golf. They really, you know, you take in these pools. Uh, I go to, I swim just about every day at, I go at the Bell, the Mountain View, to um, uh, Fairway for sure, because I live right by there. Anyway, there's not a very many people in these pools. When you talk about 50,000 people or 40,000 people that live here, they're not utilized very much. Neither is the golf, neither is the tennis. Pickleball is a new thing, okay? But the reason why we have these is to draw people into this community. And if we start eliminating tennis or, or miniature golf here at, at a, um, Sun Bowl, we don't have a monitor that does miniature golf here. Oh, not Sun Bowl. Yeah, Sundial, 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 Sundial excuse me, Sundial. We don't have a monitor that, that monitors the um, miniature golf or bocce ball. And if you come out there, you'll see a lot of people playing. Whether they card in or not, I try to. You know, I, I'll bet you 99% of the time I do, unless I forget. I, I want to do that because I want to make sure we keep it, okay? But a lot of people won't. Does that mean they don't want to use it? They're just, we're, when I first came here, I didn't like to be carded in. I thought it was, it was wrecked in my, um, they were tracking me, you know. I got over that, over that um, nomenclature or whatever it is, that who cares if they track you? They're just looking to find out, you know, making sure that you're safe, making sure that other people aren't using or abusing the facility. But when you first do it, you know, you think, man, every time I got a card in, I got a card in. Well, it's to help to keep the facility up and keep the people that are supposed to be here, here, okay? So I accepted that, okay? But if we um, don't have card ins at places and you get rid of facilities like they did at um, um, Marinette, <laughs> thank you that uh, it'll be gone, and we, and we can't. I actually heard sometime that they were gonna get rid of the golf course because they're too expensive. Well, what are you gonna do, put housing in there? Somebody suggested that they're gonna make it a, not to offend people with the dogs, a dog area. Well, that's fine, but people are in nature. There's how many, 250 million, 300 million people in the United States, okay? It goes in cycle, whether golf or tennis or whatever, or pickleball. Pickleball is a great fad because it, it's easy to maintain. But if you just watch the French Open, you know, that was a heck of a match. Uh, is tennis is still big, you know? And, uh, you know, you gotta take a look at, you, know, you talk about technology.
technology is one of the big things. I heard that Bell was going to change it and put in all the stuff for the next generation, you know. They're still going to have to get outside activity. So if we get rid of these activities, we're going to be really in a bad situation. So Thanks. please. Well, I really appreciate you coming up. You've, yeah. you've, t you've so, talked about just about every activity we have here. I know. So, and I appreciate your input. All right. um, thank but, you. you know. Uh, I'm going to cut it short. That, thank you very much. OK, thank you. <laughs> Mike Wendell, 145206. Just two things. Uh, standing committees is mostly what this is about. I'm going to reiterate, I'd like to see the communications committee come back. I think it goes beyond a technology committee and other things. It's a broader subject, and we don't have it. We used to. The second thing is, and this really follows on to some of the discussion today, is we have standing committees for golf and bowling. Those are major revenue sources. They're major maintenance sources. There's a lot of money involved. We also have a committee for lawn bowling. I don't hear anybody coming up here talking about lawn bowling issues. They got a place to go and address their issues. And maybe we ought to have a committee for racket sports, something that allows people that play tennis, play pickleball, play whisper ball, whatever it is, to have a committee to go to. And then we don't go into ad nauseum all kinds of details to the board, there's a place to go, discuss it, discuss how you may share facilities, how you may improve facilities, how you may coexist. And I think that would be something the board ought to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Totten, 148753. Um, couple of things. Thank you for taking care of the water fountain as quickly as you did. However, that does bring me to ask you, where are comment cards located that we're supposed to be able to fill out to do those things? I have no idea where a comment card is. Ms. Totten, there should be comment card boxes where you would drop them in and on the side of the blank cards at each center. I can't give you off the top of my head where each one of those are. Um, what center was the, was the water fountain issue at? Here. It okay. was, it, I happened to catch um, okay. Kevin uh -huh. and mention it to him because I didn't know where to find anything. At, at the risk of being proven incorrect, I would expect that there's one in the in the lobby way, but um, I'm sure you will correct me if I'm if I'm incorrect no. on that. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank Otherwise, you. you could also just ask a facility attendant. Okay. Yes, the facility attendants have them as well, um, but we have boxes that we ask um, cardholders to put them directly in, and that way, if there's a, a comment that is somewhat critical in nature, then our supervisory staff are the ones that that pick those up. Okay, thank you. Um, no podium? Did we decide to do no podium? We only, we were just talking about that. We only have one podium. So perhaps we could bring back the one podium and if you really have to have something to lean on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, no committee reports today? Pardon me? No, no we decided we're going to do that at the board meeting for, under announcements. You're going to switch the committee we're switching. reports. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and let me be sure that I heard you correctly. There is no phase three anywhere other than the budget. No. Okay, well. There's, there's, no, there's no architectural plan drawn yet for phase three. That doesn't mean there isn't a phase three. That doesn't mean that activities that were assigned to phase three are now eliminated. There just is not an architectural concept drawing for phase three at this point. Is there a list like you had from the ad hoc committee or um, the two town halls where things were listed? So would that, is that? I think the, the recommendation from the ad hoc committee, and correct me, if I'm wrong, but you know, we haven't changed anything on that other than I think, we, and I think it was even printed and sent out 
Um, I believe the board accepted like 90 some percent of all the recommendations. That, I'm sorry, I didn't explain myself well okay. enough. That isn't what I meant. Okay. I meant because there's a phase three in the approved budget and there's, uh, there, but there's no phase three at an architect, who knows what's going in phase three? Well, the recommendations from the Long Range Planning Committee, as I said before, have already been approved. But With they the didn't have phases. No, it doesn't matter though where it goes, it's still approved. So if, if expanding pickleball was in the, the Long Range Planning uh, or, or the ad hoc committee's proposal, it's still there. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting, you're getting I, pulled in different directions. You're looking at, you know, the actual, you know, architectural concept plans for one part, you know, and just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's gone. Okay. You know, so I think there's some confusion about that, but okay. I can tell you, now I don't, don't, off the top of my head, I believe okay. that um, the tennis courts were gonna be eliminated at Mountain View and that that space was gonna be expanded for pickleball. Mm -hmm. But I do not believe that there's any decision made on you know, the, the lawn bowling, the miniature golf, pickleball, those are, those are uh, horseshoes. I'm grabbing here for straws. I was just uh, questioning because I heard that there was no, nothing at the architects, but I knew it was on the budget. So I wondered, you know. Typically we don't do that. You know, we don't do something that's, you know, that far, far out. Ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Nancy Greathouse, 149885. I had one question and one comment. Um, Mountain View just seems to keep coming around and around mm -hmm. and around. And I know everybody would just like to say, let's move forward or stop it, whatever was gonna happen. But I noticed a lot of the committee's reports talk about things over at Mountain View. A lot of the people have stood up and talked about their activities at Mountain View. Um, at one point, I know the lawn bowling committee at the last meeting asked for a motion um, because it was, a motion was made and approved at the committee for an ad hoc committee to get all of the activities that are involved over at Mountain View and discuss what their needs are, what is going to be the impact on them, whether it's a year, two years, whatever it is down the road with the Mountain View expansion or rebuild. Um, has that, I know that that was brought up at the meeting and I believe it was called out of motion and it was not addressed after it had been motioned and passed in the committee. So I'm wondering with all that I'm hearing, would that not be a good idea to put back out there and say we need an ad hoc committee to meet with all of the activities, all of the clubs that are involved in Mountain View that could potentially be impacted during any of this address that, find out what their needs are, because as you said, Dale, things change at, over time, you know, so what was good two years ago may not be good today for them. Um, find out what their needs are, look, to the, look at the um, other buildings, what would be the utilization and availability, can you kind of pencil in that, you know, the lawn bowling is going to meet on they're three days a week, which are the opposites of what they are at one of the other areas. See if they can work it out with a potential for that. And then maybe in September and October, you say, we're gonna test it. Let's shut them down over at Mountain View, let them move and use their temporary facilities, and then get back together with them and see if it works over two months or if they have found that that's not going to be adequate or what they're going to be needing, make sure it's gonna be addressed. Just seems like it keeps coming up. Maybe that could put some of that to rest that you've actually met with all of these committee people and, at, and the clubs and such. Just a comment. Well, I'd like to, I'd like yes. to address that comment, Please. if possible. Um, and I've said it numerous times, but I'll repeat myself. Um, I have met with, you know, anytime uh, an area that's going to be impacted in Mountain View comes up that they have a concern about, I have met with them and I've sat down and talked about, you know, they had concerns about, well, what happens, you know, if we have specific concerns about the drawings and, you know, do we have an opportunity for input? And the answer is yes. If, if 
are you representing a, a, an activity? No. Okay. No, well, anymore. I will just take pickleball, for instance, since that seems to be the, the popular one that everybody brings up all the time. You know, there was concerns about pickleball. It's going to be out of service at Mountain View for, for a number of years while construction takes place. We're just throwing it out there that it's going to be 10 years, but construction, it could go faster, it could go slower. We don't know. Okay, it just depends. But I did sit down with the, the um, board of the Pickleball Club. I discussed different options with them regarding where we could possibly go. I had got input from them regarding possibly using the um, Lakeview area. You know, and after, I don't know, a dozen meetings with them, uh, we've now moved on and they, had, they brought it forward at their membership meeting because I don't want to do anything just with a few people. I wanted to make sure that the entire membership was supporting the concept of putting some courts up at, tennis, at um, Lakeview for that interim period so that they would have some, some place. And that was voted, I think there were two people there that didn't vote for it, otherwise it was unanimous. And um, then the motion went on, so now we're looking, talking to contractors and getting some ideas, conceptual plans, can we fit, how many courts can we fit in, are they going to be acceptable to the club? That's where we're at right now. So if there's a club that has a serious concern, as um, the water volleyball people did, both um, the general manager and myself and, a, and another one or two board members went to their meeting and discussed it and explained how that works. I would say to have an ad hoc committee, and the reason that that didn't pass is every standing committee has a specific purpose. And if they step beyond that purpose, that's not appropriate. And that's what happened with that one. But with that being said, if, if I've missed anybody, if mini golf has a, a question, and they want to talk about it, I, I, I'm wide open. Let's, you know, I probably will bring somebody from management. We can go over some options, take a look at some things, and, and answer their questions. That makes a lot more sense to go directly to the point than to create an ad hoc committee, which right. probably wouldn't get started until the fall. And I think people who have real concerns want their answers now. They want, they want input now. They want questions, how the process works. So that's kind of how we're doing it. Okay. Madam Thank President, you. may I also comment that yes. last year we also met with the Lawn Bowling Committee, mm -hmm. met with them twice, as a matter of fact, the board did, with the Lawn Bowling Board, yes, we did twice. Okay, I, I was just going off what I read in a committee report as far as lawn bowling, that's why I mentioned that, and then I saw that it came up at the meeting and was you know, not, not addressed there. I just keep hearing things about different clubs, different activities, so maybe it's a communication issue or something that that message is not getting where it needs to go, and that's causing a lot of rumors that are floating around, a lot of well, things that people Well, that's the see. problem with misinformation. You well, know? but if, no, if people don't have the right information, they're going to have misinformation. Correct. So you have to make sure you're communicating clearly to them of what your intent is, and I think your intent for Mountain View has been fairly wide range because there's been a lot of communication and discussion on that. Mm -hmm. However, I think the committees, you know, or not the committees, the clubs and activities, they're really more concerned with their world of how it's going to impact them mm -hmm. during that anywhere from two to ten years that they won't be able to utilize those courts or activities or clubhouses and things over there. So their concern is, I may be dead before ten years in some cases. Right, so I think so your, what your, are they your, gonna job, do? your job and everybody who watches this should be you know, if you have a concern, you know, contact someone from the board. And, 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 you know, I'm more than willing to come and talk to your, you know, your club, your committee, whatever it is that you, you know, have concerns yeah. about. I've done it, you know, with the Best Friends Dog Club, with pickleball, with um, I understand water volleyball. You. So yeah. if, 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 if lawn bowling has an issue, and then when they have their meetings, 
you know, let's, let's sit down and talk about that. Okay, and I think that that may get out, hopefully more people will see that from this meeting, that mm -hmm. you are willing to do that and, and that they should contact a board member if they have concerns about the interim of the Mountain View project, where they're going to be meeting, what they're going to be doing. I think that just needs to be a strong message for them so that they will reach out to you. I think sometimes they don't because they're concerned that it's just gonna be washed away. They, maybe they haven't had any activity or interaction with the board, so they want to make sure that their issues are going to be addressed and that they can get some answers. So I think that maybe that message will be better received from this meeting, I hope. My, my next issue, thank you very much for that. Um, my next question that I had was, I was wondering if we could get a bylaw update. I know that the bylaws are being reviewed, um, and I'd like to know what the status is on those at this time, since we're going into three months away from any uh, formal meetings. Cool, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Bylaws committee has been met weekly, every week except for last week because of scheduling conflicts. We're uh, working diligently on this stuff. I've heard as I'm, some of the issues that were raised today, again, I'm not gonna go into detail because they're closed to try to get the stuff done. Some of the issues that are raised today, I'm certainly aware of as our committee members, and we're hoping to conclude this stuff so that it can get to the board and the public in, in, the, in the not long period of range time. We've got some stuff to deal with. Okay, is there, do you have any information you can share? Because we've heard nothing except pretty much that we don't have any information to share each time it's asked. Uh, that's correct. The information to share is that we've looked at almost all the bylaws, right? We've worked in trying to reach a consensus. Um, we have some things to still work on. We're aware that there is an issue of policies versus what should be in the bylaws, right? We're aware of a number of the issues that are here. But if you're asking me to go into details as to what, what we're actually dealing with, I'm not gonna go into those details at this point because the decision was made unanimously by the committee that it wanted it closed so it could get it done. What I can say is the committee is working closely together, everybody showing respect for each other, Everybody's explained their positions and why, and a number of things have been worked out. That's, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, once it becomes public, I'll be more than happy to defend the document, but I'm not gonna go in and wreck at this, this late time um, the way we're working, but I understand your concerns. Well, can you explain a little bit about how you are, what the process that you're using for that? There's 14 bylaws and 68 sections within those bylaws. I mean, can you say we've worked through or we have completed three out of 14, two out of 14? I mean, how are you monitoring what's being accomplished to know, I mean, so we can kind of know, are you at 20%, 100%, 50%? Um, you know, we keep saying it's down the road, down the road, and I'm just wondering how far down the road we're looking at well, well, before we have any idea of what well, changes are being proposed. There's, there's, I understand what you're saying, and I, I sympathize with it. But here's the problem. Not everything has been resolved. I don't know how long it's going to take to resolve some of the things. So for me to say that it'll be finished today or next week or next month is, uh, I, I, I mean, I can't predict it. I can say that we work closely together. <coughs> We've exchanged views, we've solved numerous problems, but there are ones that aren't solved yet, and those might be able to be solved in 10 minutes or it might take days. So that's about all I can say. I understand you want more information. What I can say is any bylaws that become, there's gonna be a chance to debate some of the bylaws. There's gonna be some discussion about the bylaws because it has to pass the board, right? And, there, and it's gotta be made public. But I'm not gonna go into details now. I understand there's a number of people who are upset. But again, I'll reiterate, there was a choice that could be made. We could have kept it public and most likely accomplished almost nothing, or we could close them and work together to try to get a document and a consensus where if there is not a consensus, the minority position will be presented in some way and get it done and it'll be debated. It was the opinion of the committee, the entire committee, let me repeat, 
that mm -hmm. we wanted to go forward and get this done rapidly. <coughs> we heard the complaints about it would take a year or two or three or whatever. Mm -hmm. That is something that I don't want to do. That's something we're not going to do. You have some things that go forward once you get it. It's going to go to the attorney to make sure that it's legal, that we haven't inadvertently done anything that could jeopardize the Sun City um, designation as a senior community, that we haven't done anything that violates the law. You know, I don't think we've done that, but we're going to have it looked independently, and I expect there'll be a debate on it most likely uh, when we come back from from the uh, recess, you know. But I can't guarantee that because I'm not, I'm one of seven people discussing it. And I can give you my opinion, you know, and I'm not going to speak for others. What I can tell you is the committee is highly engaged. In fact, and I'm not going to name the person, instead of taking a phone call that came in about an hour ago about the committee and some of the provisions, I'm here. I have to make that call done. So the committee is engaged and they're working hard and they're a diverse group with diverse opinions, and everybody wants to do what's best for Sun City. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Okay. I, my other comment would be in regards to that, that you said they'll go to the attorney, I believe, and then I think they were going to the board, and I think the members were the last people that was commented that they would get a look at this. Would it not make sense, instead of paying an attorney, or whether they're on retainer or whatever we have, that those, the members would see these before you start sending them to an attorney? The attorney can, because, and the board would look at them. So that at least they're open at that time. We can see what changes are being uh, proposed. And the members, which is supposed to who's be the people who are supposed to have the final say pretty much on the bylaws, as long as it's not in conflict with the articles, that they would get a look at this. It's almost because it's done in secret. We don't even know what process you're using to go through them. Um, or how your committees are working, but 14 bylaws is not that many bylaws. I know, I went through them myself. I did mine in about 12 hours. I had thousands, basically, of proposed changes that I would like to see or that were just corrections or changes based upon the articles and such. It just seems like everything is in secret and then we're gonna pass them to an attorney and then they're gonna go to the board and we're gonna be the last people, the members, of which it affects their daily lives, are going to be the last ones to get a say in it. Ma'am? Madam Ma President? With, with all? Well, you want, I'll, I'll defer to Kat. She wanted to speak first. Yes, thank you. I, I, I'm a little concerned about your statement. Okay, the committee is composed of members of the community. Okay? There are five members of the community, a chair and a co-chair. You seem to think there's no member involvement, but those individuals are members of the community. They are representing your interests. I know that you say it doesn't seem like a significant number of items, but when those items have to be discussed among this group of community members, everybody has an opportunity to comment. That takes time. That's one of the reasons why it's taking the amount of time that it is is because everybody, every member of the committee is being afforded an opportunity to present their views. And the chair of the committee is working very hard to achieve consensus. Now, consensus is not going to be achieved on every issue. Some of these issues are extremely significant. In addition, the committee members, members of the community, have had to work at adding information to the bylaws that aren't currently in the bylaws that will make things easier for the members of the community. So it's a little difficult for me personally when people say there's no member involvement when the committee is composed of members of the community. There are, what, seven members as a total, counting the chair and the co-chair? That's, That's right. a very insignificant number of members being represented when you say there's, that they're making those decisions. The whole point is that the members will be the last ones, apparently, to see these before they go to an attorney, before they go to the board, based upon what we had been told of the, the routing that will happen. 
I'm saying that that's an incorrect way for it to be done. The members should be involved and see what is being proposed before you get it through an attorney, before you get it through the board, to vote on it and say, yes, we're passing all the bylaws, et cetera, as a group, or is it going to be one at a time as changes are being made? Um, I, I just don't want to see this slam down everybody's throats without any input and the discussion. Seven people's discussion, after a while, that gets a little bit biased as well as they start reading through and kind of forming little clicks, as you say, or as I say. Um, so I think that in order to be fair and be totally transparent, there has to be some input from the community as far as more members to bring it up and say, okay, we've got two of them finished, here's what we have, here's what we're proposing, and people can get a chance to talk about it and talk in a discussion. You're right, you can't come to a total consensus, but if you do what's right and you make sure that it follows the articles and that the bylaws are not infringing on people's pleasure within this community, and that there's no legalities being done, I don't know why it cannot be open to do that and say we're going to talk about it at a meeting, you know, article number one, article number seven, and we're going to get those resolved, set them aside. Those could even then be sent to the attorney to be reviewed to make sure. Those would be at least something being done. And I, I respect that you are doing things, that you are meeting together, that you're going over this, trying to get consensus. It's just that we have no visibility whatsoever to what is happening in those meetings, how the process is running, what the plans are. So it sounds you like you're a you, total objection I, to... I, yes, ma'am. You said that you went through the, the bylaws. Correct. And you have how many suggestions? Quite a few. How many? You said a number. I don't know, I could add them up. A thousand, I thought you said. Well, no, I, I probably said thousands, but I didn't mean thousands. Okay. But I have quite a few. Here's I the, mean, every one the deal. of them I has understand a lot. what you're saying, and mm -hmm. I respectfully disagree with you. Okay. I think that we, we are here, it is 1115, mm -hmm. in, a, in a very small group, and um, we don't always agree on a lot of things, but we try. Mm -hmm. So you're taking this monumental task and you're saying open it up to everyone for input. No, I did not say so let that. Let me just finish. Let me just finish. Uh, well, I did not say that, though. Yes. Let me just finish. That members should have an input right away before it goes to the attorney. And it's like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Before we start arguing on, you always start with the, you start big at the top. And anything that's not legally correct, why open that up for debate? because it's making a change to a bylaw, which is If it's not current, legally correct. It still needs to be brought forward that this no. is not legal, and okay. we are adjusting it and making it correct. Okay, well, I hear what you're saying, and I respectfully disagree with you, okay? And we can agree to disagree mm -hmm. and still get along, Absolutely. but this committee is doing a phenomenal job of actually moving as quickly as they are. How do we know that? That's what I'm saying, there's no transparency. We see nothing, we can't go to the meetings, we can't get an update as far as how many they have reviewed or how many are ready, how many are proposed to be ready at any point. It's, it's totally done behind the, the curtain. Okay, that's all I'm saying is that's what everybody's We're spinning here a little bit, about. but you know, that's the way the committee wanted to do it. It was voted on by committee members, it was unanimous. So we have to respect them because they are doing all the work. They are meeting mm -hmm. several times a week working on these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure when they're not in committee meetings, they're actually working on them at home. So you have to ex uh, respect the process. You may not agree with it, but um, hold judgment until the product comes out. As long as, I have no problem holding until the product comes out. My problem is that I'm concerned that the product is going to come out and everybody's going to slam it down and say, that's it, here we go, we're voting, and the whole board is going to vote and say, yes, every one of the changes is going through. That's the wrong process if that's what's planned. We have no input or no visibility into what that process is going to be. That's, that's my only comment. We talked about transparency many, many times, and the transparency has to do a lot with discussion, open discussion, or at least letting people come in and sit down and see what y'all are talking about. But I understand. Susan B. York, 112-650. I have to modify what I was gonna say because um, this is our meeting and I understand why you would wanna 
adjust things given time. Um, however, uh, committee updates, do you have any concern that if you don't, I mean, you could have simply just said there are no updates, I guess, because it really is the same information as last time. So <clears throat> you could have said there are no additional updates to keep it brief, but maybe what, what would be good is to have some sort of rule about if you want a committee update, ask for it. and. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because this meeting is only once a month. I'm supposed to be at work right now, but I'm here because I missed the last one. And we can no longer speak at um, board meetings on things that are talked about in the board meetings. It has to be an agenda item. So this was my concern. So I would like updates to, to understand where things are because I think a month long time to the next meeting to speak on it, or it may only be two weeks if it's brought up, you know, at the, the meeting that's closest to this meeting. But I would just con give consideration to that. Okay, I'm, I, I'm losing you a little bit. So what you're asking about is you want committee updates at this meeting. Right. And the group decided it probably would be more appropriate at the end of the board meeting to give the updates then. So you get the updates. Yeah, this is your meeting right. to bring forward ideas. Committee updates we're going to do at the board meeting. Okay, then I'll make a suggestion to everybody that wants a committee update that you come up here and ask for it then because it's important because we cannot speak on it at the board meetings when you're raising them. And it is our meeting, so if you want an update. But you certainly like can she, listen to the committee um, updates at the board meeting and come this come to this meeting prepared to discuss right, it. Right, but my point is it's a month late. It could potentially be a month it's two later. Weeks. It's two weeks, yeah. Well, one meeting is two weeks, because you have meetings every two right. weeks. So it could be a month, you know. That's my point, is just that consideration. Okay. But that's okay. We'll just have to con you okay. know, ask about the updates. Thank you. Bill Pearson, 133438. Uh, blow through a couple of things real quickly here. Uh, just an aside, Dale, on your comment relative to Mountain View. Uh, the largest expenditure by the RCSC, to my knowledge, was $16.2 million on the fairway project. A lot of money, beautiful facility. Um, so we're clear. Uh, one of the issues that people took exception to last year was that you did it with two votes by the board and then you voted to not have a third vote on it. And by the way, it was twice as large as, as the mountain, uh, as the fairway expenditure. Just an aside, thank you. I'm sorry, what's your name as a golf? Chris Lino. Chris, brilliant report, thank you. I've been begging for that for years, so kudos to you guys for putting it together. Um, I can go on Sun City West web pages and find that kind of information. And so it's important to see because I write things that people sometimes take exception to. Hopefully they're not calling it fake news, but um, no names, Dale. Anyway, um, let me uh, ask a question about the 990s. And I'm not trying to put <laughs> the board in an awkward position because in my three years on the board, I never saw a 990. I, maybe you guys have, which is a good thing, because you should. But the question is for Bill, because I suspect it kind of goes through you. When I look at the 990s, those numbers that are sent in are accurate? Yes, those numbers are accurate and audited. Okay, excellent. I mean, I just, I don't want to say things that aren't true. Uh, and so I know we could always find the revenue side of golf. We could never find the expense side. So, I mean, now we know what the expense side is because each 990 shows it. And I'm waiting for the 2020 to come out before I say anything. I mean, I know, I know that in 2019, the expense side was 8 million and change, and the revenue side was 5 million, 100 and some thousand. So the good news was 20 and 21, it improved because of COVID, it was the only game in town, and that, that is good news. Um, I, I don't like the minimization of that 3%, that's roughly 12,000 rounds off the top of my head. 
uh, outside play by people that don't live here, that are 45 years or older. Um, and when they step on a golf course, they buy the full play pass and they pay um, $20 around or whatever the number was, I, I think it was 20. Um, that's a lot cheaper than what, if I go on the course and play it, you know, on Sunday afternoon for $34. $20 is a lot less. So you can compare pass to pass, Bill, but it's not dollar to dollar for inside outside. I heard what you said. I pay attention to what people say. We're letting people step on our course and play. And I, again, this is just my ballpark figure. We've subsidized golf since PIF began in 1999 to the tune of about $50 million out of PIF. We're letting people from Peoria Surprise in Glendale play on our golf courses for less money than I would pay if I walked on with my wife on a Sunday afternoon. That makes no sense to me. Just my opinion. That, that, that's true. There's some people that are paying more than the pass holders, but there's, for the most part, the average across the board is $17, whereas the pass holder, the outside pass holder is paying 20. So across the board, if you, you have to look at all of the rounds played. And so, on average, the pass, outside pass player pays more. <laughs> yeah, but Bill, I mean, we Sun have City to, West pays so $3,300. I, I would just ask the, I would ask golfers if they're willing to pay $600 more for their pass if we eliminate outside play. I also meet with other general managers from the local area here, and some of them actually have in their rules and regulations to allow 25% play, outside play. So we are not the highest uh, when it comes to that, and it, it's something that we need. You were here 18 months ago saying that, you know, when we were in a loss position in golf, that we needed to break. We're even. still in a loss position in golf, Bill. Wow. Don't please don't say that. Don't insult me, please. I wouldn't insult you about it. You're piffle. You're. Okay. Do you know in 990 what what the cost, what the expense so side was? We, we, we subsidize golf because we have 350,000 rounds of golf played. We have a lot of members who play golf. When we, when we actually have potential members come into the visitor center, one of the biggest reasons why they're looking at Sun City is golf. Golf is still, even though prior to 2019 we were seeing a decline, now we're seeing a resurgence, and we still see people who want to come here to play golf. No so argument. So it's, it's needed. It's I, no, I'm not making that argument, Bill. My discuss You had three people, Alicia, Lynn, and, and Karen, stand up and say to you, outside play, we can't get on the course. Here's what it says in your rules and regulations in your bylaws somewhere. Is she making a point to me? No. No, she's making okay. a point. Seemed like it. Um, the question is outside play. It says in our rules and regulations and our bylaws somewhere, or not a bylaws, but, but board policies, it says that outside play cannot take away from residence play. Not in golf, not in 10 pin bowling. And if you want to have that discussion, we can. But you know why it says that in golf and bowling. But if somebody comes in and plays tennis, buys their $3 pass or $2.50 or whatever it is, and the courts fill up, they could ask those people to leave. Because literally outside play can't bump inside play. I'm not even arguing about golf or subsidizing. I'm arguing about subsidizing people that live in Peoria Surprise in Glendale at a cheaper rate of golf. Well, if, if you saw, we are looking at increasing the price on the outside pass as well. So I did see that, and, and kudos to you. And I do have a recommendation for you because I'm no, I'm not a golf expert. I will say to you that that so I saw what the recommendation was. I also know what Sun City West and Sun City Grand charges for a full play pass. I also know that their hundred and whatever number of players that buy the full play pass is about one tenth of what we sell in full play passes. It, that's where the question comes in. How much does golf cost us? I, now we are starting to see some data, and data is important. I believe in what Dale says. Data matters. But giving away our courses to people that live outside when we, 14% at best, play golf. That's it, Bill. You know that better than I do. I don't even care. Golf 
Sun City was built as a golfing community, community it'll stay a golfing community. The, co the question is at what cost? If we have to give away 10 pin bowling, or if we have to give away golf to people that live outside our walls, that isn't the purpose that Sun City was built on and around. There's always a question. So here's my recommendation. Let the people on the Golf Advisory Committee take these numbers, because they're the ones that are affected. I'm not on a golf course. I'm not getting bumped out on a, on a seven o'clock tea time on a Wednesday morning in February. They are, because you're letting people come in here five days in advance that don't live here, log in, sign in, and take a tea time that our members would typically take. We used to argue when I was on the board over whether golf now could sell two or three or four tea times a, a day and everybody said, ah, it's, you know, it's when nobody's there. This isn't when nobody's there. We're talking about times when our members would play. That's just wrong. Well, there's, there's no guarantee. If we got rid of every round of outside play, there's no guarantee that members are going to get the tea time that they want. Mm -hmm. At this point, we took a look at the lottery draw, and right now, roughly 70% of the requests are fulfilled through the lottery. Now, there's a lot that goes into that because you can put a range of times that you want. So if people are very picky and they say, I only want this one, one time, then there's a less likelihood that they're going to get that one time. But if you put in a range, there's more of a likelihood. So there's still 30% of the folks not getting their tea time. So if you take 3% of the rounds out of that, there's still a likelihood that you're not going to get your round or the tea time that you want. Again, I'm no expert on golf, don't want to be, at least to my concerns. The people that are on your golf advisory, I had two come, women come up to me after the first advisory meeting or board member exchange, member board exchange, and say, what do we do? I said, go to the golf advisory committee and talk about it. That's why it's there. They should make the decisions. That's my only point. Let me conclude, and I want this on the record. And I mean this, I want this on the record, so please don't lose the tape, Teresa. Um, 1975, in this very room, first quarter membership meeting, 652 members here. Myron Wagoner was the president of the RCSC. At that quarterly membership meeting, members got up, made motions, and the motions were voted on and passed. Last year, we were told we didn't have that right as members. With 1,300 1, plus members, the articles haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is the bylaws. Now, Hayden stood up and made his pitch that we didn't have that right. You might want to take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? This is sort of a comment that uh, Bruce Lamb, 110989, and this is reference to bowling. I'm an advocate bowler. I've been on some of the committees here in Sun City. I'm also on the Metro Phoenix USBC board, so I get to travel around to all the different centers throughout the state. Sun City, with your help, with Mike, the past uh, Randy, the managers and everything else, Lakeview lanes, Bell lanes are one of the premier lanes throughout the state. Well maintained. I'm also a league secretary. I'm getting gentlemen's, because uh, I manage one of the men's leagues, are asking if I have any openings for the leagues, which right now I do. People want to come and bowl in Sun City. Some of the programs that Mike has brought in, such as like the first Thursday a month, coaching, bowling with the manager, has done very well. We thought we'd go down here this last month and we had a big crew that showed up for it. People are getting interested. These are premier is because you boards keeping the lanes up, maintaining, updating, the equipment, and everything else. I have to compliment you on all the, what you have done. And as I said, these are getting to be premier lanes. If you ever go downtown to see some of these other lanes, they are terrible. I worked a tournament this last weekend. We had to put two lanes out of commission because the lane conditions were terrible, everything else. I compliment you on that. 
I also want to compliment my bowlers throughout Sun City, just to let you know, I raised money for our Bowling for Our Veterans Links, the BVL program. Sun City this year raised for our veterans $6,174 for them. And that money stays here in the state. I just want to thank the board, Mike, Vicki, Nancy, the previous members of the boards, our uh, managers, Denise and Randy. You've done a great job. I've been here for 10 years, and it keeps improving. And you're going to see more bowlers coming to bowl in these leagues and so on. I just want to compliment. I know there's been a lot of negative stuff, but this is something positive. And again, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you for your input and um, your patience for waiting till the end. <laughs> thank you. Okay, is there anybody Madam, else? Madam President. If I, if I may. <laughs> thank you. I went to the, I met with the posse this morning before I came here, and they had a, a neighborhood watch. And I just want everybody to know, you can contact the fire department. They get a smoke detector. They'll put one in your house free of charge. They will change your batteries in your smoke detectors free of charge. They also have a vacation watch schedule you can sign up for because a lot of us go away in the summer and they will periodically check your home. All this stuff is free to anyone who lives here. So go down, stop at one of the posse offices, the fire department, call them, and you can pick up a packet which will get you all these benefits. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, the next meeting of the Board of Directors will be on June 30th, uh, 2022 at 9 a.m. right here in the Sundial Auditorium. Uh, there will be no meetings in July or August, so our next meeting for the board member exchange will be September 12th, uh, 2022. Have a safe and wonderful summer, and don't forget to turn your phones back on. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. production of the Recreation Centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our Recreation Center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the Recreation Centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching.